right, we're continuing with our series on money, sex, and power. We've been spending about three weeks. This is the final message on, on sex. And for some of you, you're like, thank goodness. Others of you are like, oh. So, so it's been an interesting series. But uh, how many folks know that money, sex, and power are the three major elements you'll find in our life? Anytime there's an indiscretion or a problem, usually it's one of those three or a combination of those three. And so how, how important is it to make sure we understand that money, sex, and power are handled correctly? the way God intended it. Next week, we're going to start on power. So we're, that's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to spend some time with what God does and what kind of power, and we do have power, how we're supposed to use it as we close out our series on that. So that's what's taking place. But today, I decided to uh, talk about something that's not controversial at all. We're going to talk about homosexuality today. And, uh, you know, it's very easy to pass by this. You know what? Let's, let's talk about the Sermon on the Mount. Let's not talk about this issue. It's such an explosive issue. Uh, you cannot help today. It's perhaps the most talked about social issue in the media today. Um, if you read the newspaper or you look at websites every single day, I, I, I scan the headlines and Drudge Report and AP and USA Today, Wall Street Journal. Look through all those things throughout the day. I like news. And, and every week I look through it, I kid you not, at least three to five times a week in the major front page or the major headline, you'll always see something pertaining to homosexuality or same-sex marriage or something along that lines. It's constantly before us. In fact, statistics show, and a Pew Research, they found that, that teenagers uh, from 18 below believe that 40% of the population is homosexual. That's, what, that's what's, if you ask somebody, 30 to 40% of the people that are teenagers or younger think that 40% of the population is homosexual. People in their 20s tend to think about 28 to 30%. But you know the truth is? It's only about 1 to 1 1.6% of our population. But how many folks know Jesus died for the one or the million or billions? But what what I'm trying to do is not to diminish what happens in our society with that. What I'm trying to help you understand, there's a distortion going out. There's a narrative out that is not true. And it's important we understand that. In fact... I was reading this the other day, uh, statistics on this. Uh, this was demonstrated once again in a federal survey whose results were released in July. This is the, the latest and the hot off the press, okay? In July 2014, it found that only 1.6 of American adults self-identify as gay or lesbians with another 0.7% self-identifying as bisexual. The National Health Interview Survey conducted under... Um, the National Center for Health and Statistics in the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention collected data from over a large sample of 34,557 adults through 2013. So this is not some James Dobson focus on the family, uh, family research count. This is the government doing this. So it's not a biased in that regard. Well, probably would be biased with the government. But they're not, they're not going to try to make it look. So understand that we've been, we've been told, many people have been told, this is, everyone's got this issue. And so it's a very small segment of our population, but that's about 30-some-odd million people. That's still a pretty significant amount of people. But what does the Bible have to say about homosexuality? And how are we to, how are we to handle in our society today? What are we supposed to do? And I would say that I've seen uh, two equally destructive things. I've seen people get all upset, like the, the, Baptist, the, the so-called Baptist church in Texas where there's four people and his wife. Putting, you know, that's ridiculous. They even call the Westboro Baptist Church. It's not even a church. It's like a little three or four people together. But nevertheless, you see those folks that are just lambasting, kill, and this and the other. Meanwhile, you get other people saying, hey, man, just accept them. It's okay. So we got folks that are bombastic. And we got folks that are saying nothing. What does the Bible have to say about homosexuality? And what happens if you or someone you love, your child, your brother, your spouse, right, is struggling with same-sex attraction? What are we to do with this situation? How are we to handle it? What does the Bible have to say about it? And so we're going to look at that today, all within 25, no, all within 30 minutes. It's going to be tough. I'm going to help shoehorn this in, so I encourage you to pay attention today. But let me just, first of all, tell you what, what this is not going to be. This is not going to be a gay bashing sermon. So if you're looking for red meat, I'm not going to throw it out today, okay? I'm not, this is not about talking about those people and all that. This is going to be about what the Bible has to say about homosexuality and how we're to respond to it as a church, as a culture. And I've had ex- extensive, um, I've done extensive research on this issue over the years, probably read thousands of pages on it. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but I've looked into it. 
because I've, I've had friends that have, have fallen with this issue. Some have fallen to the lifestyle. Others are today, one person I know was healed from it. Another person struggles with it every day, but has decided to be celibate for the rest of their lives. And so I've met all sorts of people, and I met people in seminary, ironically enough, that struggled with it. And so this is a real issue. And it's, it's really easy to get upset and angry when you don't know somebody. But when you have a son or daughter or best friend or parent or uncle or aunt or whoever, when you know someone personally, it changes the equation, doesn't it? Because they're people made in the image of God. So we don't have, we don't have the luxury to sit up there and go, oh, look at them. Because the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one that's righteous, no, not one. So none of us have the moral high ground to stand up there thinking that we're better than anybody else. If not for God's grace, we'd not be standing here today at all. Let me make that abundantly clear. So this is not going to be a bashing place. This is also not going to be, oh, I'm okay, you're okay. Let's look what the Word of God says, and let's see what it says and adjust our lives to it. Okay? So let's go ahead and do that. If you could open your um, Bibles, please. To 2 Corinthians uh, 14 through 20. We're going to look there. I like what Rick Warren says. This is what he says. And I think it's a great quote, so I'm going to quote him. In regards to these type of things. He said this. Our culture has accepted two huge lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must fear or hate them. The second is that to love someone means you agree with everything they believe or do. Both are nonsense. You don't have to compromise convictions to be compassionate. He's absolutely correct on that. People try to put us and pigeonhole us in different ways. And by the way, I've known some people that struggle with homosexuality that do not, even people I've known that practice homosexuality don't appreciate the extreme cases of homosexuality. And they don't like the gay parades. They, they said, I don't like that at all because they make us feel like we're angry at everyone. We just want to live our lives. So I know people like that. And I've met people that struggle with it. So we got to stop putting people into little categories and, 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 and making caricatures of situations. This is a real issue we have to face in our society today. I could go on weeks about this, but I want to just get down to what the Bible has to say and stay away from opinion the best I can and see what the Word of God says. All right? So, the first thing I want to say this this morning has nothing to do with homosexuality, has everything to do with Jesus Christ, and it's the first thing is this. Number one, your identity is in Christ, not your sin. Let me repeat that. You want to write that down? If you take notes, write it down. If you don't take notes, write it down. Your identity is in Jesus Christ, not sin. Let me say it again. Your identity is in Jesus Christ, not sin. You see, we don't I, don't, I heard people say this, well, I'm an alcoholic. I mean, AA meetings, I'm an alcoholic, and I've been uh, sober for 25 years. And they say that. And you know what? That's not biblical totally. I think it's good to fess up and take responsibility for what you believe. But I personally believe, you're going to see in a few moments, if you're in Christ, you are a new creation. I don't want to identify with my sin. I want to identify with my Savior. <laughs> How about you? That's, that's the key here. If we're going to have any victory in any area, in our marriage, in our, our finances, our bodies, whatever it could be, any kind of sexuality or any kind of anything for that matter, we're going to have to get away from our sin and get to our Savior because our Savior is our identity, not our sin. Which brings me to the first passage of Scripture. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 20. Get ready to read that. And I wanted to just uh, set us up here before we read. This is what I personally believe. You've heard me say it before. We had a whole series on your identity last year. I encourage you to get online, get the tapes or tapes, CDs, and, and listen to it because we talked about who you are in Christ. But there's, a, I've heard Christians say this and say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm just a sinner saved by grace, which is absolutely correct. You were a sinner saved by grace. But I've heard people say, I'm just a sinner. Hey, we're just a sinner. The Apostle Paul says, I'm the chief of sinners. So I'm a sinner. So I'm a, I sin, I'm a sinner. It, it'd almost be like this. A pig plays in the mud. And so if a pig's in the mud, it deserves to be in the mud. So he says, okay, I'm a pig, and I'm in the mud. Oink, oink, okay? <laughs> now, if you think you're a pig, and you find yourself in the mud, what are you going to say? Well, I'm a pig. Pig belongs in the mud. I'm a pig. But if you're a prince in the mud, wait a minute. I'm not a pig. I'm a prince. I don't belong here in the mud. My friends, you have to understand something, and I hope you get this today. 
You are not, if you're in Jesus Christ and giving your life to Christ, you are not a sinner. You're a saint with a sin problem. You're not a sinner trying to get right with God. You are a saint with a sin problem, not a sinner trying to get right with God. What's the difference? A huge difference because your default setting will bring you back to what you think you are. If I think I'm a sinner, then if I sin, after all, I'm just a sinner anyhow. But I say, wait a minute here. I'm a saint. I don't belong in this scenario. Let's look at the scriptures, which so aptly and so accurately talk about who we are. I'm reading it, by the way, I tend to read things longer than just one verse. I don't like just taking one verse and taking it out. It's good to read the context, by the way. What are they teaching in real estate? Location, location, location. In, the, in biblical interpretation, it's, it's context, context, and context. Understand that. It's important to read around what it says where the verse is found. So, 2 Corinthians, I'm reading from the New King James Version, which I tend to use uh, primarily. But anyhow, here we go. Verse 14. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live shall no longer live for themselves. Hold on to that for a while. But for him who died, that died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Now, let's just stop there for a second. What the Apostle Paul is saying here is, I don't regard you according to the flesh. I regard my brothers and sisters according to the Spirit. Your spiritual identity is now who you are, not your fleshly identity. Though you're in the flesh, your spirit is above that, even though it's all together. Let's continue to read. Verse 16, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet, now we know him thus no longer. Listen to this. Therefore, so he's summing this all up like a lawyer before a, a, a court. Therefore, if anyone, look at your neighbor and say you're in, you're in anyone. Okay. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ. And the, and the grammar in the original Greek does not say believe about Christ. They say if you're in Christ, if you surrendered your life to Christ, if you're staying within Christ. Big difference, by the way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. What did Jesus tell Nicodemus in John chapter 3? Unless you become born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. There is a new creation, and new creation means a new individual, a new person. The Bible says if you are in Christ, therefore who you, he was in Christ is a new creation. What's your identity? In Christ is your identity. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, verse 17, he is a new creation, old things. Thank God for that. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, you've given your life to Christ. Now our job is to help other folks know who Christ is. Verse 19. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses or sins against them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now that we are ambassadors for Christ, as though we were pleading through us, we employ you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. The major point I want to help us realize, by the way, I'm, I put up with my voice today. I got a really weak voice. That's why I'm using this. I'm not trying to be a televangelist. <clears throat> but anyhow, I feel more powerful with a microphone in my hand. It just... Okay, posing. Um, but anyhow, it says, we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. So what's your identity? Your identity is wrapped up in Jesus Christ, not your sin. Do you see that? Do you see that? How important that is, my friends. That is so important. It's like you switch teams. Uh, for example, back in the 1920s, Babe Ruth used to, used to play. I'm Yankees again. I can't help myself. But Babe Ruth used to play for the Boston Red Sox. He was a pitcher for the Boston Red Sox. And then he went to the New York Yankees. Now imagine the Boston Red Sox say, hey, you need to come back to practice right now. we got a game tonight. And he say, you have no jurisdiction on me. I am now on the Yankee team. Or if I'm a British citizen and I leave Great Britain, I leave my citizenship from Great Britain, and I become now a U.S. citizen, and now Great Britain wants to, wants to tax me on my income. They can't do that anymore. Why? Because I am now a U.S. citizen. Do you see the difference? 
And you pay more taxes. <laughs> but what happens is the enemy will try to tax you from your past, but you've been bought with a price. You don't have to pay taxes to the enemy anymore. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. We must understand that. Our identity is not in our sin. It's in our Savior. Do you understand that? Please, I hope you get that today. That is so huge. If we're going to talk about anything, you have to get that if you're a believer in Christ. The Bible says in Philippians 2.12, Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not only my presence, but so much more my absence, listen to this, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. We have to work out what God has put in. Jesus says, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And so people often say in, in New Age religion and Buddhism, you have to go in. Find the God within you. Well, that's partially true. You, you're not God, but God lives in you if you accept him. The Holy Spirit takes residence in your life. It's like God buys these foreclosed homes, and maybe you're one of these foreclosed homes, and now he puts, he puts his Bob Vila in charge of your upbringing. That's called the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is going to do a job on you, going to help you to restore you, to redeem you to your original purpose. And so now Christ has the deed in the house. You can't say, I belong to this person. No, I am Christ now. My identity is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. My identity is not in my sin. It's in my Savior. I need you to say that this morning. My identity, my identity. is not in my sin, my sin, but in my Savior. You need to get that, folks. It's so important. So important. Work out your salvation. In other words, work out what's been worked in you. Do you hope you understand what I'm trying to say this morning? You cannot save yourself, but God loves you so much. He wants to see you function in the way you're supposed to function. Now, it also says in the Scriptures, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, says the following. By the way, we believe in the Bible here. That's why we quote a lot of Scripture. Do you not know, listen to this, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is what? in you. Work out the salvation which in you. What does it say? The Holy Spirit who is in you. From whom you have God. Listen to this. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So our identity is wrapped up not in our sin, but in our Savior. So you're not a, you're not a sinner. You're a saint with a sin problem. That's your identity. Alcoholism is not your identity. Um, over, being overweight or obese is not your identity. Being depressed is not our identity. OCD is not your identity. Whatever your, whatever your vice is, it's not your identity. Your identity is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. We have to establish that if we're going to stab at anything worthwhile in the kingdom of heaven. You must understand you've been bought with a price. You are not your own. And if you want to say it's my life, I do what I want, that is a satanic creed. A satanic Bible says, do what thou wilt. That's what Satanism is. When you live life your own way, I almost say this every single week. I'm going to say it again. You were designed by God, made for God. Until you live for God, you're going to hurt yourself and other people. My friends, you are designed to work with God. If you're not with God, you're going against the manufacturer's warranty. Now, looking at that, I read this quote. I can't remember who it was. I didn't cite it. I apologize, but I like this quote. It says this. Same-sex marriage makes sense if you assume that the individual is the center of the universe, that God, if he exists, is there to make us happy, and that our choices are not grounded in a nature created by God, but an arbitrary self-construction. So a lot of people don't believe in God because they don't want the problem. You know, I find it so interesting, those that don't believe in God, the Bible says, who doesn't believe in God is a fool. I mean, how many of you would like this uh, situation? Imagine that I had a bucket of about five or six different paints, and I was going down the hallway, and there was a canvas laying on the floor. And accidentally, I slipped on the tile, pushed the cart over, the pans of paint landed on the canvas, and all of a sudden, the Mona Lisa came to life. That I painted the Mona Lisa by accidentally spilling cans of paint. How many of you say that's absurd? My friends, anyone that says there's no God, it's, it's even more absurd than that. God is a God of order. He made things on purpose for a purpose. And we cannot deny the fact 
that there's a creative order to what God has to say. Before we get into our next point, the first point is this. You find your identity, not in your sin, but in your Savior. You are a saint saved by grace that has a sin problem. Second thing I want to say, what does the Bible say about the design of mankind and his purpose? If you go to the book of Genesis, it goes from the beginning. God made, right? It says he made male and female in his own image. The Bible says he breathed life upon mankind. And then he made a woman, took the woman from his side. And then Adam said, whoa, man. And that's how we got the name woman. Thank you for the, for the uh, benevolence. What's God's great design? He made us. I, rather than go to the Old Testament and talk about it, because the Bible says it's, a, it's abominable for a man to sleep with a man. It, it's an abomination. It talks about what they should be stoned and this and the other. But it also says that, that if, a, if, a child, if a child does not obey his parents, take it out and stone it. Right? The Bible says a lot of stuff like that in the Old Testament. It's like, man, okay, if you carry wood on a Sabbath, just kill him. So you read that, you're like, man, we don't do that today. So that was the Old Testament. Well, I don't have time today to break that all down. But rather than waste our time going through the Old Testament, I'm not saying go, wasting your time going through the Old Testament. What I'm trying to say is let's bring it up to where Jesus is. People say Jesus said nothing about homosexuality. He didn't have to talk about homosexuality because he was talking to a, a, a Jewish community that believed in the Bible to begin with. But it does talk about the creative order, which I want to bring to your attention now, please. If you could open your Bibles or follow along the screen to Matthew 19, starting at verse 3. Got a lot to cover. All right. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife just for any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he also who made from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Then they asked him, why did Moses do this and the other? It's because of the hardness of your hearts, he said. Verse, verse 9, and I say to you, actually, verse 8, he said to him, Moses because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from, listen to this. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife accepts sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her is divorced, is divorced commits adultery. His disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. But, he said, all cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it's been given. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, and they are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have been made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. I want to bring the context to this. There's several things I want to bring to your attention. Number one, Jesus goes back to the creed of order and says, God made Adam and Eve. He made man and women. That was his design. That was his purpose. Now, please, I'm not trying to be cute here. I really am not trying to be cute or trying to be funny. If you look at the anatomical um, design of man and woman, it's clearly, clearly, man was made for woman in marriage. It works. As a result, you have children. You have, okay. So it's clearly that was the design. Now, how many folks know we were designed to be perfect, but there's sin? So all of us have a fallen and broken nature. We don't, you know, people that have high blood pressure, was it God's intention for them to have high blood pressure? No. Was it God's intention for people to have cancer? No. Was it God's intention for people to be depressed? No. Was it God's intention for people to have all kinds of uh, problems and phobias and alcohol? No, of course not. It was not his intention. But we live in a broken world. Because we live in a broken world, we have broken people. And broken people are broken. And even though I'm a saint, I got brokenness in my life, and if you don't think you have brokenness in your life, you really are broken. All of us have brokenness in our lives. We tend to pick on the things that we don't struggle with in other people, or we tend to persecute the thing we hate in ourselves. So what is the whole issue here? He says, those have been called to be eunuchs. You know, there's some people that are called to be single. Singleness is not a disease. 
And I'm going I'm to come back to this a little later on. There are people that have decided that I, I am not going to get married. I'm going to be a celibate for the rest of my life. I'm going to give my life to Jesus Christ and the work of the cross. And there's a real advantage to that. And there's a real disadvantage to some ways. But there's a real advantage to be singly minded to Jesus Christ. So singleness is not a disease. But I want you to hold on to thought. We'll get to that a little later. So I want to help you understand something, that you and I were designed by God. God designed man and female. He does not design the homosexual uh, unions between man and woman. It just, or woman and woman, or man and man. That's not his design. It goes against the created order. If you go against the created order, there are consequences because the design is not correct. It just doesn't work. You, you do not put diesel fuel in a gasoline engine. Okay, you, you got to do certain things or you void the manufacturer's warranty. It's not that GM is angry with you if you put diesel in the car, but they won't, they won't, they won't acknowledge your warranty. Why? Because you, because you voided the warranty by doing against what they said, because they're a designer and they know what's best for your automobile. If you don't do what they say, you void the warranty. Now, I know there's a lot of stuff going on here. Just bear with me. I got like... T- Ten minutes left. Okay, we're going to go quick here. Romans chapter 1. This is one of the most famous passages on this issue. And to save time, what I'm going to do is start at 22 and get right down to the later part. The Apostle Paul talks about what happens when humanity begins to worship the creation instead of the creator. All kinds of problems begin to happen. Verse 22 of Romans chapter 1. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory for the incorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man, the birds, the four-footed animals, and creepy things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness, to the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Listen to this. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped, and serve the creation creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up vile passions. For even their women exchanged a natural use for what is against nature. Again, the Apostle Paul is talking about nature here. Verse 27. Likewise, also, the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty for their error, which was due. And even as they did not retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting. Being filled with unrighteousness, sexual immorality, which is the word pornea, where we get the word pornography from, so all kinds of sexual immorality. Wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, Evil mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, of things, and disobedient to parents. Undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgivable, unmerciful, of whom the rightness judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death not only do the same, but also approve those who practice them. Wow, what a scripture there. Then, I love what it says in chapter 2, 2 verse 1. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, who are you to judge? For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. Now he's talking to the church of his day. So he's saying, you know, he gives a big sermon. Everyone's going, amen, amen, amen. Wait, 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 before you get the amen crowd going and threatening, you know, okay, hey, you're doing the same stuff and even worse because you know better. And I would say to us today, my friends, that we are more responsible than those outside the church because we should know better. And I want you to cl- please understand here, it talks about the created order. Do you see that? It goes back to the beginning. Now, let me give you an example. I, I've read some sermons. I've listened to some sermons and people on both sides that believe various things. And just this past week, I listened to a sermon. And I actually read a couple sermons, and they talked about this. Uh, so there's some evangelical churches that are very inclusive now. This is like a, a movement among evangelicals. Saying, well, you know, you, 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 can, you need to interpret the Bible different. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose, my son's not here, he's in children's church. Let's suppose I told Luke, my, my firstborn son, hey, Luke, Luke, I want you to clean up all your Legos, put them away. I want you to brush your teeth. Then I want you to read a book and go to bed. 
Okay? That's what I told them. Okay, let's, let's make it real simple here, okay? I want you to put a, clean up your Legos and put them away. I want you to brush your teeth, and I want you to go to bed. Now, if I am a scholar, and I want you to say, well, imagine Luke came to me and said, okay, Dad, let's look at what you had to say. Let's parse the sentences here. You said, you said Luke, Dad, I know a bunch of Lukes. Do you mean the Luke of my school, or do you mean me? Because I could interpret it as another Luke. In fact, I know five Lukes. And so, uh, does it mean me, or does it, you didn't say Luke, my son, you said Luke. And there are all kinds of Lukes out there. There's even Luke Skywalker, who happens to be part of the Legos. So, um, and Darth Vader, and C-3PO, and Boba Fett. Okay, let me stop. Millennium Falcon. Okay, stop it. I like Star Wars. Okay, so imagine I say all that, and then he goes, okay, Dad, do you mean, which Luke do you mean? And, and you said, you said, put the Legos away. Well, not all those Legos are mine. Some of those Legos are Matthew's and Hannah's. So, uh, you know, there's just, just confusion here. First of all, we don't know which Luke you're talking about. Number two, I don't know which Legos you're talking about. It could be Luke or Hannah's, or maybe uh, someone that came over the house and they had their Legos there. How am I supposed to distinguish which Legos are whose? And then you told him to brush my teeth. And I've read that toothpaste causes cancer in laboratory rats. So that's a form of abuse. And I, I have a responsibility to take care of myself and not subject myself to abuse. So I don't think I want to use that toothpaste unless you use baking soda. Then maybe I'll think about it. And then you tell me to go to bed. They say if you have too much sleep, it's bad for you. So I don't think I need to go to bed at 8 o'clock. I need to go to bed at 1030. Now, how ridiculous was what I just shared with you? That's absolutely absurd. How clear was it? What did I say to do? Put your Legos away. Luke, put your Legos away. Brush your teeth. Read a book. Go to bed. But what happened? I parsed it. Well, you can interpret it this way. My friends, this is what people do in Romans 1. I heard it this past week. I've read it. Well, the Apostle Paul really didn't mean that. What he really meant was that it's so clear. In the Greek, in the Greek, it says the same thing. Granted, if you're reading poetic books like Song of Solomon, if you're, reading, if you're reading poetic books like the Psalms, yes, and Revelation, allegory. Yeah, there's allegory. This is not allegory. This is clear teaching. It's dishonest to the text. It's dishonest to say that. That's manipulative. You, you're laughing at You're thinking, how ridiculous. My friends, this is what people are doing with the Bible. I, I wish I was making this up. I'm not. I... I wish you could listen to the stuff I listened to this past week and read the stuff I read this past week over the last couple of months. This is what people say. It's clear. It's not the original design. It's just not. Sorry. Okay, what does that mean then? Does it mean we're supposed to give in to it? What does it mean? The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, people that have sex, nor idolaters, people that worship idols. And by the way, we worship idols today. Nor adulterers, people that sleep with someone that's not their spouse. Nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, which are uh, male prostitutes. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers. No extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, these folks, there's a list there. Do you see? It's not just the homosexuals. It's, it's a list, and I think a lot of us fall into those categories at different times in our lives, maybe even the way to church today. Verse 11. Listen, I love this verse 11. And such were some of you, past tense. But, 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 but. I like big buts in the Bible. But you were washed, you were sanctified, as if you never sinned, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So he's saying, listen, some of you did the same stuff, but now you are free from that because you are what? Because you are in Christ. Do you see the difference here? Our identity does not come from our sin. It comes from our Savior. What do you do if you struggle? Last, last two points. What do you do if you struggle 
or friends or family you know struggle with same-sex attraction. I call it same-sex attraction for several reasons. Number one, when you say, I'm a homosexual, you're basically labeling yourself. Remember, you are not defined by your sin. You're defined by your Savior. You can be a saint that struggles with same-sex attraction. We live in a broken world. There are people that struggle with OCD. There's people that struggle with um, depression. There are people that struggle with addiction syndromes. There are people that struggle with all sorts of things. Asperger's syndrome. We can go on and on and on. And, and, and we, we're broken people. But that's not our identity. Our identity is in Jesus Christ. So what do you do? Well, I, we have a responsibility. Shh. What do you do if you struggle? Ephesians 5, 8 through 10 says this. I love this. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good, right, and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Now the next verse, verse 11. Take no part in the deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. That's what we're doing this morning. We're exposing them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. We have a responsibility to tell people what's right and wrong based upon the Bible. Not out of arrogance. Not out of holier than that. I, I, I tell you, I... There was a time I used to drive by a church and get, literally, I used to get nauseous driving by churches because I hated the legalism that I experienced, not from my father, but from other churches. I hated it. I hated it. I even lived in the Bible Belt for a while. It made me sick. It was like this, this sick Christian syrupy culture. It was, oh, it was disgusting. I hate Christianity without Jesus. I hate church without Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Yes. All should seek healing. Don't seek to get rid of same-sex attraction. Let me say that again. Don't see, if you struggle with, with sexual thoughts of a homosexual nature, don't try to get rid of it. If you struggle with, with um, overeating, don't try to get rid of it. If you struggle with your marriage, don't try to get rid of it. What are you saying? I'll tell you what. Don't seek to get rid of these things. Seek Jesus first. If I seek to heal my marriage, what becomes my God? My marriage. If I seek to get free from being obese, guess what becomes my, my, my God? Being, being in the right weight category which can get to bulimia and anorexia, you name it. If you struggle with same-sex attraction, what happens? What becomes your God? Same-sex attraction. If you struggle with anything, don't try that first. Seek Jesus first. My friends, this church is called Cornerstone because we build our lives solely on Jesus Christ. He paid the price. Only by Him can we go to God through Jesus Christ. Your sin does not define you. Your Savior defines you if you're in Jesus Christ. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What do you do if your son or daughter comes home and says, I'm attracted. It's so hard. Our culture, listen, listen to me. Please understand this for a second. The homosexual culture. Secular society is, is it's like, it's like a great thing now. If you come out, you're celebrated. The president of the United States might even call you and thank you for becoming, coming out of the closet. I'm not trying to be political. That's what he did. Congratulations. It's celebrated now. You know something else I found? The homosexual community is very, very, very loving accepting there's a community there's family there's fellowship it helps you what happens if you go to church and tell someone that you struggle with same-sex attraction oh, you got johnny oh, he's gay. He's gay. hey johnny god bless you man we love you 
And so this guy comes to church week in, week out. People know he's got a problem with homosexuality or he struggles with same-sex attraction. I say, I say this, same-sex attraction. Let's kind of stay away. We're not quite sure we trust this guy. He might be a pedophile. He might be this. He might be the other. And, or I might, I might, I'm afraid I might uh, have those problems. I don't want to be nylon. I don't even want to touch him. I don't want to be around a person. The church should be a place that people who are broken can get help. Can I hear an amen on that, please? Who do we think we are? If you can't come and say, I got issues, what kind of church would we be? I'm not saying you go and tell them your problems, but find some faithful, true men and women. Say, listen, I'm struggling with with this same-sex attraction I'm struggling with anger I'm struggling with suicidal thoughts I'm struggling with cutting myself I'm struggling with this I'm struggling in my marriage I'm struggling with faith why not come to each other Bible says that confess your sins and one of you may be healed as long as I am the pastor of this church we will show love to people that have the same-sex attraction I would not condone it. I would not say you're correct. I would say stay in Jesus Christ. We will pray for their healing. I've known two people in my 46 years on the planet that were healed of same-sex attraction. Totally healed. I've known countless others, unfortunately, that struggle with it. I'm going to say something. I might offend some people, but get over it. I love my wife. I'm attracted to my wife. But I still have to watch out for other women. I still have to not look at other women. When I see someone that I find attractive, I have to practice self-control. I have to deny my flesh and listen to the Spirit of God. There's some people, it, what happens if you struggle with homosexuality? You should seek healing. But don't seek being healed of homosexuality. Seek Jesus first. Remember, your identity is in what? In your Savior, not your sin. The Apostle Paul had an issue that I'm going to summarize in 2 Corinthians. We don't know what it was. I, I, actually, I'm very thankful that the Bible does not tell us what his thorn in the flesh was. He had a thorn in his flesh. He asked God three times to remove it from him, and God did not do it. We don't know what it was. People try, well, it was his bad eyes, it was his ex-wife, it was this. It. We, don't, we don't know what his thorn in the flesh I thank God. If the church knew what the thorn in the flesh was, that would be the only error we could struggle with. But God, in His infinite wisdom, allowed the Bible to be ambiguous about that. The Apostle Paul asked three times, and God said to him, what? Let me read it to you. Verse 8, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And, I, and He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore... Most gladly, I'd rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sakes, for when I am weak, I am strong. Maybe you have to struggle with it. We're going to believe God until God says don't. Continue to seek Jesus. Your identity is in your Savior, not your sin. I read an article by Wesley Hill. He write, he's, a, he's a person, that's a professor at a Christian university who's, de who's decided to live a celibate life. And he writes about his same-sex attraction that he's faced. I could go into a slew of reasons why it happens, nurture, nature, whatever it could be, but uh, that's for another time. But this is what he said. Offer some advice. I quote, if, if you're someone living with homosexual feelings, Jesus' message to you is this. It's not a no to your deepest hunger. I do believe that discipleship to him entails giving up gay lifestyle and gay relationships. And that may be. Be more painful than you can imagine right now. But ultimately, Jesus is offering you the kingdom. He is offering you eternal life. He's offering you to himself in the gospel. Sacrificing your sexual freedom may seem like a high price to pay. And it is a high price to pay. But he promises you a joy so stunningly great 
that if you felt the full weight of it now, you would literally come undone. And so this, this by the way, how many folks in this, it takes courage to come out and say you struggle with something like that to a community of people. That's tough. He's actually come out and said, I struggle with it. I chose to be celibate. You see, temptation is not a sin. Giving into temptation is sin. So don't condemn yourself if you struggle with something like that. Giving into it is a sin. And I love what it says. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It's so hard to do this within 38 minutes. It's crazy. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to stand under it. If you're struggling, whatever your proclivity, whatever your proclivity is, Christ promises to deliver us. He'll provide an avenue of escape. Take the avenue when it shows up. If you struggle with these various things, stay away from people that are living that lifestyle and hang out with godly men or godly women that can help encourage you in the right way. Remember, if you remember nothing today, your sin doesn't define you, your Savior defines you. I want to conclude finally with one more verse. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We find freedom at the cross of Jesus Christ. That is our identity. You are a child of King. You're a saint with a sin problem. You're not a sinner trying to get right with God. So I'm going to pray right now. None of this works unless you give your life to Jesus Christ. You must find your identity in Him. So I'm going to pray a prayer. Maybe you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Today is the day of salvation. You pray this prayer that I'm going to say with your heart and mean it. Today is a new beginning or a rededication. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I can't save myself. I thank you for saving me and paying the price for all of my sins. I receive your forgiveness. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. God, Jesus, come into my life. I make you the boss of my life. My feelings, my thoughts, my emotions are no longer God. You are God. And with your grace and with your help, I will live for you from this day forward in Jesus' name. If you just prayed that prayer, it is a beginning in our connection card. You can write down that prayed that prayer. If you want someone to contact you, you want to come up afterwards. And I also want to pray for you that some of you that are struggling. Maybe some of the people in this room are struggling with same-sex attraction. And it's, it's a deep, dark secret you don't want anyone to know about. I want to pray for you or any other issue for that matter. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that my identity is not in my sins. My identity is in my Savior, you, Jesus. And I choose to seek your kingdom first, your righteousness. And I thank you all of these things will be added to me as well. Therefore, I don't have to worry about tomorrow. Lord, I ask you to heal me of my brokenness. I ask you to heal me of my brokenness. I receive your healing in Jesus' name. Give me the grace to run towards you with all that I have. In Jesus' name, amen.